and buenos dias and welcome to the proteins chapter of the nutrition lectures so uh, we went through carbohydrates yesterday today we'll talk about proteins and spoiler alert for the next chapter we will be doing fats all right so let me share screen and we will then get into the proteins chapter Proteins. Again, some of the stuff in here is a little outdated, so we'll talk about that as we go through. So we'll talk about amino acids, how the structure of protein affects its function, the digestion, absorption, and transportation, and metabolism of the amino acids, when and how the body uses protein to fuel exercise, the role of protein in the immune system, how endurance exercise can affect its function, state protein recommendations for athletes and again you'll see where this stuff is a bit outdated um there's some new research um that has happened over the last few years even that has really pushed some of those numbers so it's really interesting stuff um energy intake on training performance and health explain physiological basis for recommendations related to the amount and timing of protein intake before during and after exercise we'll talk about different sources of dietary proteins, an athlete's dietary protein intake, and then we'll talk about it as a supplement and how different supplements you can take, whether or not you need to take the BCAAs, um, you know, uh, rolls of whey protein, casein protein, so forth. All right, so proteins, they function optimally when energy intake is sufficient, okay, so again, when you ingest proteins, for the most part, we don't use them mostly for energy. We hardly use them for energy at all when everything else is going well. So you've got enough fats and, and carbs in your diet. Um, there's a lot of other roles they play. So they function as t um, in tissue growth, enzymes, hormones, and the immune system. But when other energy sources are low, we will utilize them. All right, so we'll talk about that. Basic components of protein is the amino acids. So uh, we'll talk about the different roles of different amino acids. Uh, amount recommended for the athletes um, is typically higher for non-athletes. Again, um, when you're working out, doing a lot of athletic um, events, you know, really stressing the body and transforming the body so that it's a highly functioning machine. And you've got to, you've got to be able to repair everything that gets used and damaged during the time of training. And that's what the major roles of proteins are. Okay, so again, when you damage uh, muscle tissue and you need it to grow bigger and stronger, all right, we'll use it for that. When you deplete enzymes and hormones during those uh, training events, we've got to replenish those, okay? Immune system's got to then go in and and try to heal um, damaged tissue and things of that nature. So again, you've got to rebuild that, right? So you got to, it supports so many different um, things going on in your body all at once. You need to make sure you've got the right amount. So athletes have a higher need than non-athletes in that sense. Now again, um, some of you may have really high physical functioning jobs and you're not necessarily an athlete, again, um, you've got to think of yourself maybe in those terms of needing higher amounts of protein so that your body can regroup and replenish itself um, between days of work, all right? Um, supplements, um, so again, do you need to supplement protein? Well, if your diet is on track with everything you need, no. Um, but again, most of us probably um, might find it difficult to get enough protein um, and at the time that we need it. So taking, you know, like a protein, um, you know, making a protein shake or other, you know, if you want to take it in pill form, however you want to do that, that's up to you. You can supplement it in. Um, it's not that it's better. It's not that it's worse. It's just, you know, you basically got to uh, look at it as the same as your intake of food. Um, and consumption after exercise is important. Now, again, 
we'll talk about the anabolic window and we'll talk about how important that is. But um, instead of thinking about it with about getting the protein right within that particular window, because I know some people, um, especially those that only work out, there are some folks that their stomachs may be queasy after they eat, you know, but everybody tells them you got the anabolic window you got to hit, right? Um, that's not necessarily what this particular point is making. Yes, you can take it in immediately after exercise, but what it's talking about is you want to continue to eat foods, or you know, again, you can have complete meals, or you can have the protein shakes, or whatever, to get that protein afterwards so that you continue to um, fuel the body um, with the energies it needs, but also continue to give it the uh, protein it needs so that you can um, get it into the muscles, get it into recreating more enzymes, hormones, and rebuilding that immune system. So proteins are found in both plants and animal foods. So yes, you can be vegan and vegetarian and get quite a bit of protein. Um, on the other hand, those of you that are omnivore um, in your dietary practices, um, you'll find it a lot easier to get enough proteins, all the proteins, and, and again, based on your needs, you'll get the abundance that you would need. Okay. So basic structure of an amino acid. All right, so um, you'll see where the nitrogen is. That's where the amino group, all right? So you always see the H2N. Um, you'll see a, another chart here later that has these. Um, there's side chains. Um, all the different amino acids will have different side chains and then the carboxyl group. All right, so here's, we're gonna go in order of um, alphabetical, the different proteins, all right? These, these are not in order of um, importance or anything like that. So, alanine, um, it is a dispensable protein. Um, it is glucogenic, um, not ketogenic, and can be produced in the muscles from pyruvate, but must be transported to the liver for conversion to pyruvate. So we'll, you'll see a slide here later that kind of shows this, to produce glucose, important glucose generating pathway during starvation. Okay. Arginine is condi conditionally indispensable uh, glucogenic, yes. Ketogenic, no. Sparganine, it is dispensable. Glucogenic, yes. Ketogenic, no. Aspartic acid is dispensable. Uh, glucogenic, yes. Ketogenic, no. One of the two amino acids that makes up the structure of artificial sweetener, aspartame. Okay, so those of you that um, use aspartame, you know, you get it in your sodas or you use it as a sweetener in coffees or whatever else that you like to use it for. Um, this is one of the two amino acids that makes that up. Uh, cysteine is conditionally indispensable. Uh, glucogenic, yes, ketogenic, no. Uh, glutamic acid, dispensable. Glucogenic, yes, ketogenic, no. Glutamine, conditionally indispensable. Glucogenic, yes. Ketogenic, no. Represents about half of all the amino acids in the amino acid pool. We'll talk about that. Um, glycine, conditionally indispensable. Glucogenic, yes. Ketogenic, no. Isoleucine is indispensable. Glucogenic and ketogenic, yes. And it's a branch chain amino acid muscles can use as an energy source during prolonged endurance exercises when muscle glycogen stores are low. Okay, so again, this is one of the ones that we can, you'll, um, you may utilize, especially if you are a um, ultra marathon runner, um, you are, you do uh, Ironman triathlons, um, or you are starving your body of other nutrients that you need. So you're not eating enough fats and carbohydrates in your diet and you are now having to break down amino acids for energy. Okay, so this is one. Um, we've got leucine, which is indispensable. Um, Again, if you go back here, we got the glucogenic and ketogenic. So glucogenic, no, ketogenic, yes. Another branch chain amino acid muscle can use 
as energy source during prolonged endurance exercise when the muscle glycogen starts are low again. Lysine, indispensable, glucogenic, no, ketogenic, yes. Uh, methionine, indispensable, glucogenic, yes, ketogenic, no. Phenylalanine, or phenylalanine, I never can say that one right, indispensable. Gluco and um, keto, yes. One of the two amino acids that makes up structure of the artificial sweetener aspartame. So this is the second one, aspartic acid. Uh, proline, conditionally indispensable. Gluco, yes. Keto, no. Serine, dispensable. Gluco, yes. Keto, no. Uh, threonine, indispensable. Gluco, yes. Keto, yes. Tryptophan, this is one that you always hear about with turkey, right? That supposedly makes you tired if you get too much of it. Um, again, it's not the tryptophan that makes you tired after your Thanksgiving meal. It's the fact that you just ate like 6,000 calories, okay? Um, and gluco and keto, yes. Tyrosine, conditionally indispensable, gluco and keto, yes. And valine, indispensable, Glucose, yes, keto, no, branch chain amino acid muscle can use as an energy source during prolonged endurance exercise when muscle glycogen storage is already low. All right, so this gives you a chart and shows you how the different makeups are. Um, again, when you, um, you can see the different uh, nitrogen, um, the NH3s um, through there. Um, so there is your amino group. Okay, and then you can see that they all have the different branch chains, all right, that makes up the different structure of each protein. These are 20 indispensable and dispensable amino acids, all right. Now, this book calls them dispensable and indispensable. We call them essential and non-essential in, in most texts, but you can, they mean the same thing. Uh, protein quality, so proper amounts and types of amino acids. So animal and plant proteins differ. Animal proteins are termed complete. Um, proper amounts and types of all the indispensable amino acids. Um, plant proteins are termed incomplete, which means it's missing one or more of the indispensable amino acids. And we have complementary proteins. So when you combine two plant proteins to provide all the indispensable amino acids. So um, probably one of the most typical meals that you will see in many cultures is a mix of beans and rice. I'm um, down here in Miami. Um, there's er, the South Florida area. Um, you know, if you look at all the different um, Latin restaurants you go to, they all have different versions of beans and rice. Okay? Um, where I grew up in New Mexico, you know, beans and rice are combinations, um, different combinations that you can eat. Um, you know, you've got um, other areas um, with different influences. So again, where I come from there, we eat a lot of like pinto beans with rice or refried beans and rice. Um, you know, we've got other areas that eat red beans and rice down here. Um, I've, since I've been here, a lot of dishes um, have black beans and rice. Those are all uh, different um, types of complementary proteins coming together um, to provide indispensable amino acids, all right? So structures of um, peptides and polypeptides. So a peptide has two or more amino acids combined. A dipeptide um, is two amino acids. Tripeptide is three amino acids, which makes sense. Um, and polypeptides have um, more than three amino acids in their groups. Uh, primary structure will determine how a protein will function. Okay, so it'll give it it'll give it what its primary uh, muscle tissue is going to be for uh, replenishing enzymes, replenishing hormones. What does it do? Secondary structure is the weak bonding of the amino acid in close proximity. Um, so and rigidity and stability, such as in collagen. So we'll talk a bit about that here. The tertiary structure is the interactions of amino acids not close proximity, the positive or negative charge, such as plasma proteins. The primary structure is a protein that's made up of two to four poly. All right, so the functions of polypeptides. So enzymes, they catalyze um, 
chemical reactions or they speed them up. So again, we, um, you know, uh, in, in your body, you have slow reactions, fast reactions, so the um, enzymes will help you to break things down. Right, quaternary structures allow enzymes to interact with other compounds. Hormones um, are the chemical messengers in the body. So um, some of the examples that this chapter talks about is insulin, glucagon, HGH, um, again, uh, testosterone, progesterone, um, or some other examples of hormones. Secondary and quaternary structures are important for the proper functioning of these hormones. Structural proteins provide rigidity and durability. Actin, myosin, collagen are examples of structure proteins. Um, so again, when we're rebuilding muscle, um, actin, myosin filaments, uh, collagen. Um, again, with rebuilding not only muscle, but we have collagen in our joint structures um, as well. So again, when your body damages those, um, you know, if you you're able to, you know, areas that have high vascularity will rebuild better than those that have low vascularity. And secondary and quaternary structures are important for the proper function. Transport proteins. Um, so again, we can transport compounds in the blood and the plasma or the lymph system. So uh, hemoglobin is an example of a transport in the blood. And lipoproteins are transport in the lymph system, okay? Um, so, you know, you may, may not be familiar with lipoproteins other than if you've ever had your cholesterol checked. You hear about HDL and LDL. So, H, HDL and LDL. Um, so, when your doctor talks to you about the HDL and LDL, you always hear you want to have good HDL or higher levels of HDL and lower levels of LDL. Okay? So, High density lipoproteins are your, your good cholesterols and low density lipoproteins are what are considered your bad cholesterol, okay? Um, and then VLDL is very low um, density lipoproteins, right? But um, these are transportation compounds in the blood system, in the plasma and your lymph system, all right? Um, quaternary structures allow interactions with other compounds and then your immune system protects your body from invasion of foreign particles and antibodies are polypeptide chains. Therefore, again, you've got to get your protein in to rebuild any of the uh, antibodies that you've used in you know, protecting your body from infection. If you had infection, got over it. Um, if you've had you know, an injury um, and had to go in and rebuild structures, you've got to rebuild those with ingesting proteins. Right? Um, digestion of proteins, they're denatured in the stomach. Uh, hydrochloric acid, that's the HCL right there, will activate pepsin and broken down further in the intestines by their digestive enzymes. All right, so hydrochloric acid um, is one of the most corrosive acids. Um, you know, if you look at it on the chart of acids, I think it's just below that of battery acid. Um, and again, inside your stomach, it's fine. Your, the, the lining and the mucus inside the stomach keeps it um, from eating through your body. Um, but again, it is necessary to break down the proteins that we ingest. Okay. Absorption of proteins, primarily in the jejunum and ileum. Okay. So again, um, in the intestines is where we do most of our, di our digestion. So two thirds of those will come in the forms of dying tripeptides, and one third will come in the form of amino acids. Indispensable amino acids are absorbed more quickly than the dispensable. Pre-digested protein supplements. Um, so again, when you take in them as amino acids, do they work any better? Um, no. Um, you, so if you buy the BCAAs versus the whey protein, it doesn't seem to have any um, benefits um, versus, you know, taking them in a protein form, okay? Um, you're going to get, you know, and again, when people ask me that, look, I mean, if you've got a BCAA dealer that hooks you up with a good deal on buying BCAAs and you'd rather take them as BCAAs, go ahead. 
Um, if you are getting enough protein for your diet and your whey protein shake, then, you know, I mean, I can find whey protein at Costco for 20 something bucks for um, a six pound bat. And I'm getting all the, all the BCAAs I need at a much cheaper price than what I've ever seen them online or in stores for. I just get them in full protein form versus the branch chain amino acid form. So, uh, you know, that's when, whenever anybody asks my opinion on, do I need to buy the BCAAs? I always ask them, well, are you supplementing protein? Are you eating enough protein? Do you, you know, I mean, what are you doing? Because that's going to affect my answer to that. Um, you know, and if you're, if you're going to be buying a, another protein supplement, then no, you don't need to get the BCAAs. So, you get those through that, and you know, especially if you're eating fish, eggs, chicken, you know, beef, um, you know, uh, beans, rice, um, you know, any dairy products have lots of protein in them. Um, you're going to be fine. You don't need to spend extra money. BCAAs, right? And so there's exogenous and endogenous sources of um, proteins. Um, transportation of protein. So the liver is the clearinghouse for most amino acids. And, um, so you hear that here in a bit. Branch chain amino acids circulate immediately in the plasma. So again, um, you know, this is where people get this idea that they got to take them in BCAA form. But in your body, um, you know, you're going to get them when you're, when you're eating all those different sources. Blood uh, amino acid concentration is increased for several hours after protein contains the meal. Um, the amino acid pool, this is where free amino acids circulate in the blood or fluid in your cells. Average of 150 grams of amino acids, which is approximately 80 grams is, of that is going to be glutamine. More dispensable than indispensable amino acids in the amino acid pool and always in flux because of protein turnover. All right, so again, what consists of that? Well, what are you eating? How often are you eating? Um, from the dietary perspective, what are you doing to your body? You know, how much do you exercise? Uh, what type of exercise are you doing? You know, are you mostly cardio? Are you doing strength training? Um, you know, how often? Right? All those things are going to play into um, the in the flux of the amino acid pool and your protein turnover. You know, how much fat and carb digestion are you getting as well? Again, this is showing nitrogen intake turnover and excretion um, in the next few slides. So your seen dietary proteins coming in. Um, again, in the stomach, gastric juices and hydrochloric acid and pepsin um, will, will uh, denature those as they get into the um, small intestines. Um, digestive enzymes from the pancreas. Um, will then help break them down further. So you see the amino acids go through uh, straight to the blood. The small polypeptides, dipeptides, and tripeptides um, will then be broken down as they enter through the intercellular cells and endons. And then we'll enter the blood vessels. Sorry, I got the garbage guy over here right now, so I gotta talk louder. It should be a little less noisy here in a minute. Um, so again, deamination of amino acids. All right, so this happens in the stomach. Um, so you will see um, the amino acids will be deaminized. Um, again, um, PLP, um, which again is a vitamin B6 containing enzyme, um, is needed to then deaminize. So basically it removes the nitrogen group plus ammonium. Um, just kind of a side note, because we'll talk about this in one of the later chapters when we're, when we're talking about eating disorders. Um, I remember when um, we were having a talk about um, working with especially distance athletes. Um, a lot of times with some of the female distance athletes, when you get to the elite level, some of them may have some eating disorders. And one of the things one of the coaches talked to us about is the fact um, that when you have an eating disorder and you're not eating enough, your body breaks down more amino acids. 
right? And so one of the things that may be sort of a, you know, besides the fact that usually when somebody's not eating enough food, you know, their body will start to wither away, but if all they're breaking down is mostly amino acids, they may have kind of ammonium smell, or ammonia smell to them as they sweat. And so this was another one of those things. So just kind of looking at this slide, just throwing out some little extra there that you may be able to smell, you know, they may smell like somebody's been, you know, like they've basically been uh, cleaning their floor with ammonia, okay? And they'll have that kind of ammonia smell because that does get broken down through the emanation of amino acids, right? Somebody has a high ammonia smell, maybe that's, you know, breaking down way too many amino acids, right? Again, amino acid metabolism, um, when we were talking about the different energy systems, um, again, this is one that's in the oxidative system. So you will um, see that um, all the different amino acids so, um, are going to be broken down through the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, right? So again, um, we kind of hit this earlier when we were talking about the oxidative system, but this one now you can see where all the different amino acids come into play during the Krebs cycle um, and how those are um, then broken down and metabolized, all right? Protein anabolism and catabolism. Um, liver plays a major role. Deaminations, removal of amino group, which we talked about. Um, alpha keto acid is formed. Optimized for energy, nitrogen is then excreted. Transamination is the transfer of the amino group. So process used to form dispensable amino acids in the liver. And amino acids not used by the liver at time of absorption become part of the amino acid pool, which we talked about earlier. Skeletal muscle and anabolism, all right? So this is, this is the building and storage of muscle and um, of um, skeletal muscle, right? So stimulation of genes that synthesize specific proteins. Um, an example of mechanical stress or force produced in muscle stimulates genes that regulate muscle protein synthesis, right? So that's what we exercise. Transcription, translation. Um, so basically what we usually talk about is it's like building, you know, it's building a house, right? So um, if you're building muscle, building more muscle. So the more that, the more that you stress those muscles, they, they build stronger. This is why, you know, when you think about it from, from a, um, not inside the body, but you're actually working out, this is what you see, okay? So you say, you, you know, you're, you're lifting, you're able to bench press 100 pounds, right? You're able to do that a few times. As you continue to do that, all these things that we're talking about right here are what is going on inside the body with the amino acids and the building of the muscle, okay? All of a sudden, what you were able to do with the 100 pounds could be like four reps, you know, for a few sets. Now all of a sudden it's five reps, six reps. Next thing you know, you're like, hey, let's add some more weight, right? So as you keep stimulating those muscles and stressing those muscles, you will see an increase in your ability to um, lift more weight or push against more resistance okay and again there's a lot of things that will play into how fast does that happen um, you know like how much size do you see with that so the type of training you do um, again genetics so looking at the next part the factors that influence skeletal muscle anabolism um, man some people just put on weight you know like I had a buddy uh, Dave that and the guy hardly ever lifted I mean, he's just a runner, and the guy was just well built. Um, and you know, I lift and lift and lift all the time, and I don't build muscle real fast. And this guy, you know, he never lifted, never lifted. We go in the gym. Next thing I know, this guy, I mean, he just like every day. I swear he looked bigger. Now it may not have been that quick, but it's just you know genetics. His his body's just very um, receptive to resistance training. Okay. Um, and he did he over the time that we looked at for several months, his body changed quite a bit, right? Um, you know, high levels, I think he had high levels of testosterone and just, you know, his body really utilized the, uh, the proteins that he had, okay? Um, 
Again, um, nutrition, um, make sure you got enough protein and energy intake, right? So remember, um, one of the things is we don't want to catabolize protein if we don't have to, all right? So make sure you're getting enough fats and carbs so that the proteins will get all the other processes that we're talking about. And then the immune system with hormones, with enzymes, and most importantly, talking about on this slide, with rebuilding muscle, all right? Catabolism. This is where the amino acids are not stored for future use. Um, they can be used for energy. Again, they have the, they yield the same amount of energy as a carbohydrate, so four kilocalories per gram, or is um, most of the time people just talk. We remember kilocalories and calories and the way that we talk about them are the same. Um, it's not your preferred source of energy for exercise. All right, and again, when you're ut utilizing it. it we're going to show it here in a minute. It's it's a bit of a bit of a stress on the system to utilize proteins. All right. So again, your body has a protein sparing effect if it can, um, unless you force it into you using it. Amino acids have different entry points in the Krebs cycle. We saw that earlier. If you go back a few slides, you'll see where all the different amino acids come into the Krebs cycle. Um, six amino acids are commonly used by muscle. So leucine, isoleucine, thallium. Um, these are all, uh, which is a branch chain amino acid, aspartate, asparagine, and glutamate, um, and protein breakdown is stimulated by cortisol. Right? Um, stress of prolonged endurance exercise um, is, uh, in most people, would be the reason that you're going to catabolize protein. So, you know, if you have a healthy diet and everything else, this would be the main reason. Now, again, not eating um, some of these crazy diets people are on, not eating enough food, or um, somebody has um, disordered eating or, or a full-on eating um, disorder, um, that can also cause it as well. As muscle glycogen declines, leucine oxidation will increase. Amino acids rarely provide more than 10% of your total energy throughout the day. So again, I said your body your body never shuts down one system, so there's always some amino acids that will be broken down throughout the day, um, but very, very small percent. And again, um, rarely more than 10%. Um, if you have a really good diet of, and you're getting a positive fat, it's going to be quite a bit lower than that. Amino acid catabolism produces ammonia, so I told you about that before. Um, ammonia must be converted to urea and excreted in urine, so nitrogen is lost every day in urine. Um, so again, that's, you know, I, you're not going to get 100% away from that, but it does happen. Amino acid and gluconeogenesis. So again, we talked about gluconeogenesis before, but this is where we make glucose out of something else. So we can make glucose out of fats and we can make glucose out of proteins, all right? And again, um, Neo means new, genesis means birth or um, creation or make, okay? Um, so that's where we get that word. 18 of the 20 amino acids can be used to produce glucose. So again, um, this is where, you know, if you're on a ketogenic diet, this is where you're hoping to um, make up some of the glucose um, that you are not getting in from your diet. Um, and again, it's um, your body does not like to use amino acids and um, you may not, one of the problems that you run into is your body gets, um, once you get catabolizing proteins, you may not be able to get all the proteins into all the other areas we talked about with making sure you have enough hormones, enzymes, your immune systems up to par and rebuilding the muscles, right? So you got to be very careful with that when you have low carb intake, okay? Effects of training on protein uses. Um, endurance training um, enhances fat oxidation, so amino acids are spared. So again, your body won't use them unless they have to, um, but you know, if you don't have anything else, it will burn it, right? So this, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, so this is going to show you um, in particularly how um, the body will use um, honey and glutamate. Um, so if you look over here in the muscle, um, you've got glycogen, which is broken down to glucose, then goes to pyruvate, 
right? The pruvate can be um, sent to lactate, which then will come all the way back around um, through the blood back to the liver, um, back to pruvate. Um, now again, if you want to recreate that pruvate, look back over in the muscle section. Um, the, when you have glutamate, so you have um, the keto regular, the keto glutarate um, is going to help um, with the creation of glutamate, and that glutamate is going to go back to uh, keto glutarate. So from the pruvate, you've got the alanine, right? So we've now gone from the pruvate goes to lactic acid, goes to alanine. Alanine will then be transporting the blood over to the liver, same time the lactate comes, all right? At that point, we can then use that pyruvate to create new glucose in the liver through gluconeogenesis, which we talked about before. So again, this shows you uh, kind of the complexity of creating um, glucose from um, alanine, and glutamate. And again, you'll see at the bottom part of the liver where the, um, the uh, nitrogen is then taken out and pneumonia, and you'll excrete it through urea. All right. Um, so you might hear about nitrogen balance. All right. So if you have a positive nitrogen balance, this is where we're talking about the body's got an ability to um, anabolize or, or create more muscle mass. All right, so this particular individual in this picture definitely has positive nitrogen balance. Uh, next picture, this is a picture of a, a, a war hero that's been brought back during World War II that was in a concentration camp. And again, you can see his ribs and his chest, which is not something that you would normally be able to see, as well as you can see also on his arms and neck. Um, again, this is what you call negative nitrogen balance. So his body's been basically catabolizing all the amino acids because he was in starvation for however, however many months or years that he was in the concentration camps that he was in. All right. All right. So here's the summary of the functions of proteins in the human body. So component of enzymes, they're special, the enzymes are specialized proteins that speed up or catalyze chemical reactions in cells. Again, this book kind of simplifies some of these things that they do. But, um, component of hormones and signaling proteins. Um, hormones, many of which are protein-based, regulate metabolic processes and signal proteins, cytokines, are known as growth factors and combine to the surface of the cell and influence the cellular processes. Structural proteins, components of muscle, connective tissue, so ligaments, tendons, skin, hair, nails, Transport proteins are part of molecules that allow compounds to be transported, such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, iron, and fat, so again, in the blood and also in the immune system. Immune system proteins are fundamental components of building and rebuilding the immune system. Acid base regulators, amino acids have both acid and basic groups, which help the body to keep its pH um, optimal. Fluid regulation. Proteins, especially those found in the blood, help to maintain fluid balance. Sources of energy under normal conditions, minor energy source. Under temporary stressful conditions, small but important source of energy. And under severe or prolonged stress, such as starvation, a major source of energy, but is detrimental to your health. So again, you saw the uh, World War II veteran in that picture, and you saw how that um, shape his body was in, okay? Um, your body does not want to do that. So don't put it into those type of situations, right? Um, you know, again, this is sort of mostly for a fail sake, you know, again, you've seen the movie Pass Away, something like that. You know, in times of need, yes, your body will catabolize and will, you know, you're gonna use as much fat and carbs as possible, but your body will have to catabolize protein and starvation. But don't purposely do that to yourself. All right, so this is where the book will get a little bit, um, I'd say outdated when we're looking at protein recommendations based on activity. Um, sedentary adults. Uh, yeah. 
essential folks out there working, we thank you for what you're doing. Um, I'm having to do my lectures outside because I've got food. Kids inside makes it impossible. I'll let them get one more pan and then we'll resume. Things we got to do during the quarantine, right? All right, so here we go. Recreational athletes, one gram per kilogram of body weight. Endurance athletes, 1.2 to 1.4. Ultra endurance, 1.2 to 2.0. Strength athletes, they take you up to 2.0 grams per kilogram. Now, again, you'll see in the um, in SCA strength conditioning text, it'll say 2.2, which is a bit higher. Um, just to kind of throw in, um, if you go to the ISSN and look at some of the data that they have and some of the um, experiments that they've done, um, especially uh, Dr. Antonio, um, he's done several experiments where folks were eating three grams per kilogram of body weight and it was showing how much it helps in um, not only preserving uh, lean skeletal mass but also increasing um, and again no side effects as long as you know all other conditions were normal with you know the rest of the diet and even up to 4.4 grams per kilogram of body weight were ingested in one study and again no side effects, okay? Um, does that mean that there is not a ceiling to the amount of proteins you can eat before you might see some side effects or some detrimental effects? No, um, but the answer is we just don't know what that ceiling is. Again, 2.2 um, is probably a good recommendation to most athletes, um, you know, that are trying to maintain muscle mass or trying to um, increase muscle mass. Um, Again, you can't eat more than that, um, and you know uh, some of the studies are you know short term. Some of the other studies were over a year, and they showed no detrimental effects to kidneys, liver, or anything like that. So um, just take that into consideration. Um, you know some of these texts are very uh, moderate in what they prescribe, um, but again, there's some really good research out there on protein, and I would encourage all of you to go look at some of those studies and look at the parameters and look at the amount of protein that they were taking in. Also look at the fact that there were no side effects. You know, again, these are folks that aren't eating all protein, low carbs, low fat. These are folks that are eating a good amount of fat and protein. So normal diet, just an increased amount of gram per kilograms in the diet. Okay. And they were seeing no side effects. So, um, in, in most of those, uh, again, in all those studies, they were showing an increase in lean mass versus fat mass. Okay. Um, <laughs> side note of that, um, those of you that like to get your protein in through um, peanut butter, um, they did one where they did a protein uh, uh, peanut butter overfeeding study. Again, because peanut butter has a lot of fat in it, um, they did see muscle mass go up, but again, you saw um, their fat mass go up as well. So um, not, you know, I, I'm a pro, or I'm a peanut butter lover, um, you know, so again, understand the sources of protein and, you know, you know, keeping your fat mass or keeping your fat intake and carbon intake um, where it needs to be so that you're moving the calories is also really important with the increase of the amount of protein you take, okay? Um, again, you, you don't want them low, um, but you can't exceed the ceiling of those because you will see the other side effect of the increase in fat mass along when you're increasing your total uh, calories with especially with fat and carbohydrates. All right, so protein recommendations. Um, again, this is to me this one this is a little um, conservative, but um, for this book, this is what you need to understand. Relative amounts can be inaccurate if energy intake is inadequate. 10% of total energy intake is typically equal to 0.8 grams per kilogram a day. And that's not bad. Um, for most people, most people ask me, you know, like, what should I be getting? And I'm like, you know, I mean, 0.8 grams is fine. I usually say, you know, a gram per kilogram a day um, for, you know, if you're not, if you're not stressing the body and doing a lot of exercise. Um, general guidelines, if energy intake is adequate, 
Um, 10 to 15 percent for endurance athletes above, 15 to 20 percent for strength athletes above that. Uh, gram per kilogram basis preferred. Um, again, the absolute amount is going to depend on you and how you handle that. Um, so for vegetarian athletes, and again, vegetarian, you know, there's so many versions of vegetarian. So again, you know, vegetarian athletes, you know, I, I've got a, a former colleague that's a vegetarian athlete and he's a, he eats quite a bit of dairy, so he gets a lot of eggs and things like that. So um, again, he gets he can get quite a bit um, of protein outside of um, just plant protein. But again, when you get into you know like say full on vegetarian like a vegan, um, because of the lower digestibility of plant proteins, they need to look at adding ten percent of the recommendation. So you know if they're supposed to get based on you know they're an athlete, and they need about you know, two grams per kilogram at 10% of that because a lot of what they're going to take in um, will not get absorbed as well as those that eat animal proteins. Again, I'm not saying this to discourage you from being a vegetarian um, athlete or vegan athlete. Just understand that, you, you know, to see the changes that you want, um, you've got to take in more of those particular things. Same thing I say with iron and some of these other things that are better absorbed through animal sources. You just you gotta make sure that you're getting enough of that um, because the plant protein digestibility is a lot less, all right? Um, energy intake should be sufficient. You wanna emphasize protein-rich vegetarian sources to meet those needs. Timing of protein intake. So consumption after exercise, what about this anabolic window? You know, so those of you that have been to the gym, all your, all your bro science buddies, really, you gotta get your protein shake in now, right? I mean, well, there's some studies that have shown, um, again, that is the anabolic window important? Um, the, the way I would answer that, um, does it exist? It does exist. Do you need to take advantage of that? Um, that's really more of a personal preference. Now, again, if you are a bodybuilder and you need every little bit of uh, you know like an edge that you need it may make a difference for you most of us no Mo most of us it doesn't you know so if you're one of the and, and the reason i'm saying this is because um, i'm not trying to discourage you from eating protein right after you work out but there are folks that right after they work out their stomach just doesn't feel like taking in anything much less something with protein okay so for those of you that can't eat within the anabolic window and get protein within the anabolic window, is this going to play against you exercising and trying to you know, bulk up or get stronger? No, it will not. Okay, it, it, It's really a minute um, increase that you might see over time. Um, most studies um, where they look at folks that are not you know, really maximizing their exercise and nutritional rate, you're not going to see any difference between those that get it right after and those that don't. Um, where we see this is folks that are really trying to maximize, you know, the, the little tiny satellite guy. You know, again, these are elite athletes that may see if they eat within the anabolic window versus not eating within the anabolic window, um, they may see some minute advantages of taking advantage of that too. Most people know it's not a big deal. So it, it gets highly exaggerated in the gym culture um, of making sure that you get it within that tape. Um, now, one of the things people don't really worry as much about that they should is the carbohydrate intake um, right after exercise as well. Okay? Because again, you just depleted a lot of glucose and glycogen. Um, so yes, protein is important for rebuilding. Um, you know, tissue and enzymes and hormones and immune system, but again, your carbohydrates, which you just depleted through your monster workouts and training sessions, need to be rebuilt as too. So as one is important, the other is important. So you want to make sure that you get both. And again, this is where it's important to make sure that you're, you know, getting good, complete meals throughout the day. And again, you don't need it right afterwards, um, but it does help. Right, you know, again, the, the sooner you start getting it after your workout, the sooner um, you start uptaking and 
utilizing those things depending on the, the, the uh, glycemic index of the, the carbohydrates that you're taking in and so on and so forth, okay? Um, and again, high glycemic carbohydrates will stimulate insulin secretion. All right, so your body will uptake those. Um, it, it'll tell your body to, for the cells to take in carbohydrates um, sooner rather than later with insulin. Okay. Um, and that also stimulates amino acid uptake in the muscles. Okay. So again, um, you know, if you're, um, if you're going to take in protein during this so-called anabolic window or any time, really, if you want to <coughs> uptake amino acids um, sooner as well, um, you know, having, you need to have uh, glucose um, in your bloodstream to stimulate insulin, um, to also stimulate amino acid uptake. Um, now, two things here. One, this sort of goes against some of the, the keto theories with that, um, of building muscle and being keto. Um, again, if you have low blood sugar, um, a, you know, can you build muscle? I, yeah, you can. Um, but again, it, you know, when you're trying to maximize things, again, this is what's important for athletes to get their, their carbohydrates. Um, two, you will also find in the weight training culture, there are folks now that try to use insulin um, as a hormone to help boost their their anabolism of uh, protein. Um, and so you've got bodybuilders who are not diabetic who are now taking insulin. This is a very dangerous game to play. Um, it's not worth the risk, so please do not do that. Um, and the, the uptake, I don't think is probably really worth it um, in the end. Amino acid intake immediately after exercise is beneficial, um, but again, it's not like a huge, huge increase that we see versus people who don't take it immediately after exercise, right? So as long as you're getting, you know, really, as long as you're getting enough protein within your 24 hour period, so each day um, to um, meet the needs of what you're doing to your body, you're fine, okay? So it doesn't matter when you get it, just as long as you're getting it throughout that time, you're fine, all right? And consume food or beverage with animal proteins, um, get animal proteins um, are, are better digest or higher digestible versus plant protein. But again, um, as long as you're getting your, your needs in abundance, um, you know, you're fine, all right? Um, other protein timing issues, protein prior to resistance exercise, or folks that try to slam their protein shakes before. And, and the problem is, is when, if you're doing really heavy exercise, you're gonna slow down your metabolism for the blood is going to be more intelligent. Working muscles, your digestive system slows down, and this can cause you some digestive issues. So just be careful with that if that's something you're trying to do. Um, maximum amount of protein that can be absorbed at one time, again, is not known. Um, you know, there's for years I heard from professors and folks in the gym industry, you can only take in roughly like 20 something to 30 something grams um, at each serving. Um, and again, that's one of those um, myths that has been debunked. Um, it really probably, there might be a maximum number that can be done, but it's probably gonna be, um, you know, it, whatever that is, it's gonna be dependent on the person. Um, and again, we haven't found what that is yet. So um, look at some of the studies where folks are taking, um, you know, like 50, 60 grams of protein and they're measuring to see what's taken and, and again, we don't know what it is. So um, if we don't know what it is and you've seen some of these studies with high protein ingested at different settings, then you know that more than likely you'll be able to take in at least that amount, okay? <clears throat> so what are the short-term effects if you intake proteins above the recommended levels? Um, high protein intake seems to be safe in healthy adults. Um, again, you know, if you have kidney and renal disease and things like that, it may be, you know, like you consult your doctor. Um, because again, a lot of, uh, as you saw, um, there's a lot of work that goes into the liver, um, as well as the kidneys and um, breakdown and catabolization and catabolization of proteins. Um, and things like that. So just, you know, 
you have kidney issues, you have liver issues, and then you have to consult your doctor about, you know, what, you know, how much protein you should be taking in and, and with the nutritionist and, and those type of things. But if you are healthy, um, you don't see any issues. Adequate fluid intake is needed for vent dehydration. Um, again, that has really nothing to do with protein. It is, you know, any more than it does the fact that you just need adequate fluid take, intake for vent dehydration. Consider protein intake in relationship to the amount of carbon fat you need, right? So um, depending on what type of athlete you are, what type of training you are, what your, what your goals are. And long-term effects, increase, um, increased calcium excretion, um, impact on renal disease. Um, again, um, you know, there's the, the studies I've seen on, on calcium excretion are, are just dependent on a lot of things with somebody's diet, you know, what are they getting enough of, not getting enough of it, and things like that. It's not just um, based on protein in and, in and of itself. Um, you know, and there's, there's been some studies that have shown that, it's, that uh, protein is, you know, again, doesn't have any side effects and it doesn't, it's not going to make you, you know, more protein you take in, it's going to make you pull the calcium from your body, um, from the muscles and bones, and, and show any side effects of that. And again, if, Impact on renal disease, um, you know, it, it really is, you know, again, that's, that's outside of um, my expertise, that's outside of what we're talking about in the book. So, again, if you have renal disease, you need to work with the doctors on that with the protein intake. Um, energy restriction, protein intake, um, long term substantial energy deficits, um, more, more protein will be needed. Um, again, if you're not getting enough other calories, you will utilize that um, as an energy source, and you don't want to do that. So, if your protein intake can be low to marginal in some athletes with disordered eating, eating disorders, and we'll talk about the difference of those and all the different eating disorders um, in later chapters. Long term small energy deficits, patterns of eating may be small um, daily energy deficits. Again, some days you're able to relax, some days you're just busy, and you don't. And increase in daily protein intake is prudent. Um, really, all this is saying is that, you know, if you're trying to refeed the, the, all the needs of the body that we talked about earlier with enzymes and, and uh, hormones and rebuilding um, muscle and connective tissues and immune system and all that, get your protein, get your protein, get your protein, right? Intermediate terms, small to medium energy deficits. Evidence is lacking that high protein energy deficit diets are more effective for fat loss and maintenance of skeletal muscle. Um, again, I've seen some good studies on that, which it shows you know people in uh, poor deficits but are eating well enough protein um, are able to maintain more skeletal muscle through those energy um, deficits. Um, there's one I believe the ISSM I put out um, last year, the year before that showed that um, it preserved more um, muscle mass. Um, so again, you know, some of the stuff in here is a bit lacking um, in that. Um, and again, how low of carbs and, and fat may, you know, um, I, again, when we, we talk about good safe deficits, we're not talking about people that are losing like five to 10 pounds a week. Most folks when we're recommending to, um, you know, cut back body fat percentage, you know, the healthy world's recommending about a pound to two pounds weekly um, at most, right? Um, such diets are often recommended to be prudent. Short-term substantial energy deficits, loss of water and protein may be substantial. Again, if you notice you're losing a lot of um, weight, um, you know, make, if you're not hydrating well, a lot of it can be mostly water, water loss versus fat loss. Intake of protein below recommended levels, body cannot maintain protein balance, skeletal muscle mass and functionality may be reduced, and your immune system can be neg negatively affected because you're not rebuilding what you're using, right? So again, it, it would be, you know, like think about this, you know, if we're thinking just fuel-wise, like you drive your car, right? If, if you use a quarter of a tank to get to and from work every single day, um, and then, but you only refill like an eighth of a tank of that over time, you're gonna run the tank down, right? And you're not gonna have any fuel for the car. 
if you're not putting enough of the substances back into these different systems that require protein, those systems are going to have detriments and eventually they may fail. Okay, so make sure you're getting enough of the protein that you need so that all your systems run at full capacity. Okay. Um, so this is just showing um, some different diets. You got 2,700 um, reduction calories without restricting the protein intake. Um, showing the percentage of total calories in each one, um, in the grants per program in each diet. So again, um, you can reduce your energy um, in, you know, so you can get in deficit and try to keep your protein levels up. Um, and again, um, isn't, depending on how much carbs and fat, which this doesn't really talk about, um, you know, with that, you're going to see an increase in the utilization of protein as an energy source um, if you don't keep the other energy sources um, at a good level, even though you're reducing them so that you can see a reduction in fat mass. Right? So these next um, slides are going to just show you basically like um, when you're kind of comparing peak, um, how much protein is in like, you know, like, you know, so if you look at the first part of this one, for example, these are all three ounces of different um, animal sources, right? So if you look at this, the highest source of protein is going to be lean cuts of beef, right? So three ounces gives you 30 grams of protein. Um, next highest source is going to be um, chicken, the, the white meat on the chicken. Um, going on down, um, turkey, um, tuna, um, so on and so forth. And, they, you know, and again, other things you got to take in consideration with animal sources is how much fat you're getting with that. So again, with the beef, 30 grams of protein, 8 grams of fat. So you know, if you're trying to uh, restrict your calories or whatever, um, you may want to go with the 26 grams from the chicken with the 3 grams of fat. Um, again, if you're not getting enough fat source, you know, you know, the beef may be the better, the better choice, so to speak. So again, it just sort of depends on what your caloric balance is with the protein you need. Um, animal related products, so again, when you look at cheeses, eggs, and so forth, um, you know, milk's got um, eight grams, um, doesn't matter if it's whole reduced or low fat. So those are just all reducing the amount of fat in there, okay? Um, then you got cheese, um, eggs. Um, the cool thing about eggs is you absorb um, like nearly all of the protein that you ingest out of an egg. It's like the most bioavailable, or, you know, when you're looking at like a perfect source of protein because you're, you know, or, or what I would call the most, um, efficient source of protein um, when you ingest it, that one is the most efficient because your body absorbs um, more of it versus your other sources. Um, so again, it's the most bioavailable is what we call it. Okay. Um, beans and corn, this is showing you a vegetable complementary protein um, dish um, where you know, you're getting the incomplete proteins from both the, to help form complete proteins. So plant sources, um, again, these are all different plant sources, everything from beans, bread, lentils, nuts, peanut, um, peanut butter, again. Um, so again, if you look at the source, um, so let's go back so we'll go up so you can see this. So it goes amount, protein, fat, carbs, and energy, right? So again, um, the amount of protein in peanut butter, I'm gonna pick on that because I love peanut butter, um, you're getting eight grams per two uh, teaspoons, uh, 16 grams of fat, six grams of carbs for a total of 180 calories, right? Um, you know, so again, when you're looking at these, a lot of the plant sources are going to have, um, you know, so with the animal sources, um, we, you know, we go back, um, no carbohydrates in the animal sources. Animal-related products, you know, so when we get into the dairy and all that, you've got more complete type of meals where you're getting, um, you know, protein, fats, and some carbs, right? Or 
where some of them are mostly parts versus the patches that come in through this. Um, when you get here with the plants, that's what you'll see. You'll see kind of a common, uh, better combination across the board of where you need proteins for the And then, um, when you're trying to decide based on your needs, when you're trying to decide based on, you know, I need more parts here, more fats here, along with the proteins. Um, these are the things that you gotta look at. You don't just look at, you know, okay, well, how much protein is this, right? So you gotta, you gotta look at all these different things and also the amount of calories. Um, when you're trying to keep the calories either above, at, or below your expenditure, okay? So protein supplements, um, again, are heavily advertised as drinking power athletes. Again, I think, you know, um, they really have Herbalife or uh, Plexus or any of those things for weight loss, um, their weight loss shakes, so to speak, that is basically the solid it's in. Um, most of them are very, you know, like there's little to no carbs, little to no fat, some protein in there. And the majority of them, you know, the weight loss shakes, the way they work, you know, again, there's nothing magical in the shakes. You know, it's not like they have some magical protein in them. Um, the way those shakes work is, again, you know, your friends that are selling this, you know, they, they tell you, okay, yeah, it's got all this different stuff to make your body metabolize fat faster, which isn't true. What it is, is the low calorie shakes, and they tell you, all right, take a shake in the morning for breakfast, take a shake it in the afternoon, and possibly a shake at night, don't eat anything else, right? Or two shakes, and you can have one meal somewhere. Again, how's it working? Well, those shakes are low cal. Um, most of the shakes are higher in um, protein versus anything else, so they're not really, you know, it's not really that your body, like we talked about, likes to utilize that as energy source. Um, and so what you've done is you've reduced the amount of calories you're taking. Again, how long you can stay on that particular diet, doing two to three shakes a day, and one meal or zero meals a day is really going to be up to you and how your body feels, and most people can't stay on that. Um, again, that's why those are usually short-lived successes, so to speak, in weight loss. Um, and again, um, I think protein supplementation, I have no problem with it. I supplement uh, protein shakes into my diet, um, but I don't use them as my end-all be-all. Um, they are exactly what that word is. They're supplemented into having a normal diet. So I eat, I eat other meals and then supplement protein in to help meet the needs of the increased protein I like to have for the type of training I do and trying to, um, you know, at times when I'm doing a lot of, a lot of the energy expenditure, doing a lot more cardio work and things like that, trying to get faster on the runs, mostly just to maintain, and then other times when I'm trying to bulk to actually increase my muscle mass, okay? So again, I use it more as an excess tool to what I'm already eating um, I'm not replacing anything with it, okay? And again, if you, you know, if you eat a lot of meals throughout the day and you want to replace one with this because it's, it's mostly protein and low calories, that's okay. I'm just not a big fan of folks that replace everything they do with protein supplementation, okay? Um, so again, this is showing you some different ones. So the top is whey protein. Um, again, these are the, these are actually brand ones. So it shows you, you know, how many scoops um, with it or uh, myoplex ready to go drink on um, the action from the ounces and so forth. So um, the, the whey protein that they're showing here, 100% whey protein fuel, um, is a concentrate and isolate. Um, from, and again, whey is a, a, a product of milk, okay? Um, so this one's got 130 um, calories. It's 25 grams of protein per scoop. Um, two grams of fat, four grams of carbs. This is typically what you see in most protein um, shakes when you go to the store. If you're buying one that's not like a weight gainer or anything else, um, that's a whey protein. This is pretty typical. You'll see 25 grams of protein. Um, low amount of fat. I've seen some that are like one gram, some that have like 2.5 grams of protein. It just, you know, that, that may vary a little bit, but it's not, it's pretty typical. Um, the Myoplex um, Ready to Go Shake um, has more energy. Again, it's more protein, um, a little bit more fat, quite a bit more carbs. The Heavyweight Gainer, um, 
is less protein in the mild flex. Um, it's in between the, the low and the mild flex. Um, more fat and definitely more carbs. And again, the reason is because they're trying to increase your calories, right? You're trying to gain um, weight. And then the protein plus bar um, is close to um, calories and it's the mild flex. Uh, less protein, um, more fat, and again, more carbs in that one. So again, depending on what you're trying to get out of it. Um, so if you're looking at this, if you're looking at something you want more protein percentage versus everything else, the whey protein would be the best way to go out of these different ones. Because of the low carb, low fat mix, and you're getting mostly protein in comparison to percentage. Potential amino acids, right? So do you supplement them? Do you not? Um, again, if you're taking a good uh, complex, you know, like whey protein, you're going to get them in there. So do you need to take them extra? No. You need BCAAs as extra? No. Okay. Um, if you've got way too much money and you just want to spend extra money and buy them, you know, the, e, the EAAs and BCAAs on top of all that, then that's what you need to have for it. But not any more effective than uh, taking in whole protein form. Um, the thought process is somehow they get through more than get through and utilize the whole thing and utilize them faster. Um, I haven't seen one research study to support that. Um, HMB uh, is a metabolite of leucine in untrained athletes. And again, there um, I just saw uh, another study posted not too long ago on this that shows the same thing. In untrained athletes, um, and a, the one I just saw was another one um, from the ISSN, was that it showed increase. Um, it, they were doing a leg training study in untrained males. And again, there those that supplemented this in, in um, particular did see an increase um, in muscle size. Or, uh, the way they put it is fat free muscle mass, okay? Um, versus those that didn't. Um, and again, in trained athletes, they didn't do this in the untrained and do it in the trained athletes. But again, um, in trained athletes, we haven't seen much effectiveness with it um, doesn't mean that it may not be beneficial and if it's beneficial in the untrained athletes you know if I got a trained athlete asking should I take it be like Ooh, okay what are you seeing well I see an untrained athletes that works what about the trained well it might right it's one of those things that's might it's just you know with everything else that they're getting in are they getting enough of it because again trained athletes are better about their full-on diets and all those so is taking excess is it going to help is it not or are they just getting enough of what they need we don't know so again i guess if you are an elite athlete looking for any little edge that you can get i wouldn't discourage you from taking it but i can't promise you it's going to help you out either at all right because it's just not really known so we need more studies um you know, and, and we need, you know, more control of seeing what people are getting in and not getting in and, and whether or not it would, it's really going to make a difference. And yet, it makes a little itty bitty difference, I guess, you know, to me, really that, like, little big differences can be the difference between getting a 100 million paycheck versus the 50 million paycheck. So, you know, you do what you got to do, right? Glutamine, conditionally indispensable amino acid. Endurance exercise is a physiological stress. Um, glutamine is a fuel source for your immune system cells. My glutamine supplements help reduce risk for infection. Um, effectiveness has been mixed in the research studies to date. So glutamine is another one most people ask me why I am like, look, if you want to buy it's, if you've got a good whey protein that's got everything in it, you're going to be getting glutamine in it. Your diet's been increased in glutamine. Do um, you need excess? I don't know. Um, again, um, we really haven't seen anything that really shows, you know, it, it, it's not like folks that supplement in like full protein, we, we see the effects of like adding the excess protein into the diet. And we see these clear cut results that, yes, by adding more overall protein in your diet, we see these increases in muscle mass and all the benefits. Um, you know, same thing with, uh, we talked about um, creatine, we, you know, all these creatine studies show the benefit of having creatine glutamine in and of itself, by itself, 
we don't see it when you just supplement that particular one by itself. Now again, are you getting enough of it from the rest of the things in your diet? Is that why we don't say don't want it? Okay, so again, it's one of those, you know, if you've got money and you want to spend money on it because you feel like that excess food mean is helping you go ahead. Um, there's no scientific support to back it up on that. Um, everything shows that, you know, if, if, if it is, if you're getting any effect, it's not statistically significant. So, um, especially when you look across, you know, the different studies, you just don't necessarily see it. doesn't mean it's not there, right? Again, more studies, um, maybe more studies with higher, higher control um, on what people are taking in and things like that give us better ideas, okay? So more research is needed to really give you a good um, recommendation. So me in particular, when I recommend, I always ask people, you know, do you have too much money burning a hole in your pocket or are you trying to save some? And, you know, if you've got too much money burning a hole in your pocket, go for it, see. I mean, if you feel like it helps you, then and, and you see a difference, great. Um, if you're like me and you're always trying to save money, then you know, you know get you a good weight protein. Right, MBCA is again. I'm mean, gonna give you the same recommendations on this. Leucine, isoleucine, valine, 10 to 30 grams supplement of MBCA is some safe effectiveness. Again, it's mixed in the research. Some promise for decreasing mental fatigue, improving immune response. Again, you can get all your BCAAs from you know like all your food sources and you know having a complete whey protein supplement. Is again, you have money burning a hole in your pocket, you're trying to save it. And I'm going to give you the same recommendations with the BC gas. Glucosamine, um, again, supplements sold to relieve joint pain in athletes and osteoarthritis, often sold in combination with food um, is Glucosamine is produced by your body, it's not related to any dietary intake. Known as a joint lubricant, um, again, in quotes. Proposed mechanisms may prevent breakdown of cartilage and stimulate cartilage synthesis and may delay progression of osteoarthritis. Um, 1,500 uh, milligrams of glucosamine, 1,200 milligrams of chondroitin seems to be safe. Um, doesn't work. Some people, um, I know people that swear by it. I know people are, you know, like I've tried it. Um, again, it, it's been years since I've tried it. Um, I've had several surgeries on joints. Um, I do have osteoarthritis and some different joints from some old injuries and the fact that it seems like my body tends to um, favor that. Um, when I was trying to take it, I didn't see anything happen. Again, maybe I'm a non-responder. Um, I don't know. Um, I will say I had a dog that used to get arthritis um, and after a day or two of giving him that, um, he, he, his joint would swell up. And after a day or two of giving him that, and it worked wonders on him. Okay. Um, and again, the vet said, yeah, this is the you can run. It worked fine for him. So it helped him with, with his joint. And, his, um, and, you know, again, is it going to work for you? The best thing I can tell you with that is if you're having joint issues and, you know, you uh, you have osteoarthritis, um, you could try it, you know, and then give it, give it a good effort. Don't take it, you know, some people take things sort of there to you know, hey, this doesn't work. You know, go buy your bottle of it, take it for the right, right minute period of time, see if you see any difference. Um, you know, after a while, if you just feel like you're listening, then, then yeah, you take it. Um, again, if you, you know, see any benefits, you feel any benefits, Again, maybe it's placebo. Does it really matter if you see benefits, whether it's really working or placebo? Man, take it. You know, I always tell people that too. They're like, well, what if it's just a placebo effect? Is it working? Yeah, okay. What does it matter if it's placebo if it's real? You know, if you feel better on something or you feel like it's working, you know, I tell people that all the time. They're like, what about pre-workout? You know, is it just placebo? I'm like, man, it doesn't matter. If for you, if you take a pre-workout and you take this supplement and you you know, if it's placebo and you're just going in the gym and busting your butt harder than you normally do and you're getting effects versus if you don't take it, you don't work as hard, man, it's worth the money, isn't it, if you're seeing the effects. So, again, um, you know, that, that's sort of my take on some things when we don't quite have the research that completely backs it up is if you feel it works for you, you go ahead until there's that point at which you're spending money on something that you don't feel is working for you. And at that point, it may not be worth it.
Okay, and again, only if it's safe as well. Again, um, you know, this seems to be safe for individuals. Um, so that's really up to you. So in conclusion, protein is critical nutrient for our bodies. The body is in constant state of protein intake, turnover, and excretion, especially the more active you are, you are doing a lot of stresses to in your body is going to need more than those that are more sedentary. Sufficient energy intake is necessary for protein anabolism. Prolonged endurance exercise results in catabolism of some protein for energy. All metabolic pathways are integrated and visceral and skeletal proteins can be broken down under adverse physiological conditions. Many athletes consume safe and healthy amounts of dietary protein. Some athletes are at risk due to low protein and energy intakes. Again, we have some athletes that have um, eating disorders, so on and so forth, but they're just not good eating habits. Um, and there are many sources of protein, including animal, plant, um, and protein supplements. So, you know, a good mix of all of it um, can really help maximize your training. And most athletes can meet their protein needs from food alone. Um, but protein supplements are likely to be safe for healthy adults. So again, when people ask me about supplementation, um, I always say try to get your diet right first, and then whatever you're lacking of, if you're having trouble doing it with, with your diet, like getting like you, you know, you feel like okay, I just don't see a good way to increase my protein other than supplementation. Or, you know, again, it's just more convenient for me to take a shake at this point and I get even less. Um, I don't like when people use supplementation, you know, like they, they supplement everything and they don't eat their food, right? So again, um, you know, adding it to a diet that where you're getting all the other things, because again, when we're looking at protein in itself, when we're talking about the plants, the animals, and the dairy, you need all the other things that come from those other than just the protein, because you need the fats, the carbs, Need the vitamins, the minerals, and you may not be getting complete sources of that. And then you can say, oh, well, I'll just take a multivitamin. It's really not a good habit to in the fact of supplementing everything. Right? And some things are not absorbed as well as when you get them from the plant and animal and animal sources versus when you're taking them in pill form and powder form and things like that. Okay, so again. And some of those, you know, like, you know, like whey proteins and, and like, uh, you know, like the DHA and the P and the simple when you talk about fats tomorrow. Yeah, you know, they, they get that from the fish oils and things like that. But some things you just don't want to eat as well. So good diet first, add what you need in as you see the deficits. All right. Um, so that's the protein chapter. If you have any questions, you guys, please let me know and I'll help you out. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.